Good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kim Bottomley, the president of Wellesley College, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to a discussion of harnessing global consensus, shaping the world's new development goals. I'm delighted to see so many people here today, including, of course, our 40 Albright Fellows, Wellesley faculty, staff, alumni, and friends. And I'm also delighted to welcome our participants from around the world who are tuning in live stream. Welcome. Let me also extend a warm welcome to our distinguished guests on stage who have joined us for this conversation. Thank you. Today's discussion is part of the 2015 Madeleine Corbell Albright Institute of Global Affairs at Wellesley College. The Institute is named, of course, for the first woman to become U.S. Secretary of State, a woman, a Wellesley woman, who proudly hails in the class of 1959. The Albright Institute encourages interdisciplinary thinking and learning, intellectual exchange, and in doing so, it exemplifies the power of the liberal arts, bringing together diverse individuals from different disciplines and different perspectives to examine, to debate, and to ultimately help solve the critical issues of our time. And so we're delighted to have the opportunity today to learn from and engage in conversation with our expert panelists on the topic of ending poverty and transforming economics through sustainable development. Let me introduce our panelists. Ambassador Elizabeth Cousins is the 2015 Mary Jane Durnford Lewis Class of 59 Distinguished Visiting Professor of the Albright Institute. Ambassador Cousins has a distinguished career in international public service and is a champion of peace building initiatives, security, and sustainable development. Recently named Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the United Nations Foundation, Ambassador Cousins served from 2012 to 2014 as U.S. Representative on the United Nations Economic and Social Council and as Alternative Representative to the United Nations General Assembly. She has traveled with the United Nations political missions in Nepal and the Middle East and worked extensively on peace building and development issues in conflict zones. Ambassador Cousins, Thank you for being here today and for being an important part of the Albright Institute. Homi Karanth is a senior fellow and deputy director for the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institute. Dr. Karanth studies policies and trends influencing developing countries, such as aid to poor countries, the emergence of the middle class, the food crisis, and global governance and the G20. He has served most recently as the lead author and executive secretary of the Secretariat supporting the high-level panel, advising the United, Na the United Nations Secretary General on the post-2015 development agenda. He also spent 26 years at the World Bank, including his role as chief economist in the East Asia and Pacific region. He is widely published, and his latest co-authored book is entitled the Last Mile in Ending Extreme Poverty, which is scheduled for publication in March. Dr. Karras, thank you for joining us today. Madeline Corbell Albright, Wellesley Class of 1959, served as U.S. Secretary of State from 1997 to 2001, becoming at that time the highest ranking woman in the history of the United States government. From 1993 to 1997, she served as a U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations and as a member of the President's Cabinet. In addition to earning a BA with honors from Wellesley College, she holds master's and doctorate degrees from Columbia University's Department of Public Law and Government, as well as a certificate from its Russian Institute. She chairs both the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs and the Pew Global Attitudes Project and serves as president of the Truman Scholarship Foundation. In 2012, Secretary Albright received from President Obama the Presidential Medal of Freedom 
the nation's highest civilian honor. Secretary Albright, thank you for the example you have set for generations of Wellesley women and for leaders around the globe. I'm grateful that you continue to give so generously to, of your time to Wellesley College. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Robert Parlberg. He's the Betsy Johnson Class of 44 Professor of Political Science here at Wellesley College. Professor Parlberg's area of teaching and research has centered on food and agricultural policy with a focus on farming technologies and poverty in the developing world. He is the author of several books on international food and agricultural policy, in 2013, Oxford University Press published the second edition of his book, Food Politics, What Everyone Needs to Know. And this coming year, Oxford will publish his most recent work entitled, The United States of Excess, Gluttony and the Dark Side of American Exceptionalism. Rob, thank you for moderating what I know will be a great conversation. And again, thank you all for being here today, for supporting the Albright Institute, and for believing in the continued value and relevance of the liberal arts. It's my pleasure now to turn the program over to Rob Harald. Well, thank you very much, uh, President Bottomley, and thanks to, to everyone for coming this afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to be asked to moderate this Albright Institute. This is, this is always one of the highlights of the year at Wellesley College, particularly for our Albright Fellows and also for people like me who teach international relations <laughs> in, the, uh, in the political science department, which was Secretary Albright's uh, department when she was here and where copies of her senior honors thesis still occasionally circulate. Uh, <laughs> as uh, a model of, uh, of careful scholarship and level-headed thinking to which our students should aspire. Uh, but um, our focus this afternoon is on uh, an important process that is underway in the United Nations to uh, draft a new set of sustainable development goals, targets, to be met by the year 2030. These new goals are to uh, supersede an earlier set of millennium development goals uh, that were uh, set uh, in to create targets that should be met, met in the year 2015, the year that's just now started. We aren't going to meet all of the millennium development goals, but surprising progress has been made, and that includes in in the area where I do much of my work, which is international food and agricultural policy. The, the Millennium Development Goal for 2015 was to cut by half the proportion of hungry people between 1990 and 2015 uh, to reduce that number by, that percentage by half. Uh, we haven't gone all the way. We've gone from 19% down to 11%, which isn't half. But that's uh, substantial progress. And in at least 34 countries, the percentage of hungry people was cut by half by 2013, which was two years ahead of schedule. Uh, but many of the countries where I work uh, in Africa are still uh, suffering from inexcusably high levels of chronic undernutrition. Uh, prevalence of undernutrition may be 25 or 30 percent in many of these countries, and it has scarcely come down since 1990. So here there is there's much more uh, work to be done. It's failed to fall largely because of our inability to increase the productivity of the smallholder farmers, most of them women, who uh, work in, in the African uh, countryside. Now, um, most of us who, who work in the area of development have ourselves been personally motivated at some point 
by a, a personal face-to-face -face encounter with people living communities that are struggling uh, with, with deep uh, poverty. Uh, it's something uh, that's not always easy to experience, but it's an important experience and it's something that changes you uh, for the better. And one of our students on an all paid, all expenses, an all paid, all expenses a trip to any African capital where they would hire a vehicle and a, and a driver that knew the local languages and they would be expected to, um, to head up country at least four hours out of the capital city off the tarmac road and uh, walk uh, through uh, the bush into a, a farming community and talk to uh, the farmers that they would meet there, the women that they would meet there, many of whom would be not much older than our students, but already with, um, with families to raise and with daily labor to do, uh, bent, stoop, hard labor, uh, toil in the fields, and with very little expectation that their children uh, will have a life any better than their own. This can be a, this can be a changing experience. It's, whenever I come back from a research in communities of this kind, I'm re-motivated to, uh, to do more research, to teach, and to, uh, and, and to work for change. Now, our panelists uh, today are all serious change makers in the area of development. As President Bottomley noted, uh, Homi Karas uh, served as the lead author of the high-level panel that advised the UN Secretary General uh, on the post-2015 development agenda. Ambassador Elizabeth Cousins has, among many other things, served as the principal, principal policy advisor inside the US diplomatic community uh, to support the work of the Sec Secretary General's high-level panel. And of course, Secretary Albright, uh, in her uh, long experience as US ambassador to the UN, uh, as the US Secretary of State, where she uh, fought hard to defend U.S. foreign assistance budgets against uh, constant attack from very powerful and not always very well-informed members of the Congress. Uh, Secretary Albright uh, has fought these battles nobly and well, and the Aspen Institute uh, these days um, hosts an annual lecture, a development lecture, uh, in her name and in her honor. Uh, so. Let me start the dialogue, or I guess it's a, it's a trilogue, um, uh, by, by trying to put a, a human face on these issues and by asking our panelists if, if they would be willing uh, to recall a moment when they had a personal encounter with uh, an impoverished uh, community somewhere in Asia, Africa, or, or Latin America, the communities that are the intended beneficiaries of the Sustainable Development Goal uh, enterprise. And let me ask uh, Homi if you'd be willing to start. Well, uh, uh, thank you for uh, that. It's, uh, uh, it is interesting to, uh, uh, to think about these communities. And uh, when uh, I was working at the World Bank, uh, Jim Wolfenson, uh, had just come in as a, a president and was very concerned that there was this big gulf between all of us who were sitting in Washington and the people, the clients, if you will, that the bank was really uh, trying to uh, serve. So he started a program of encouraging all of us to go out and spend a week in a village uh, learning about how people who actually tried to live on a dollar or a dollar 25 a day, what that really meant. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, those of you who heard uh, President Obama in the State of the Union saying, you know, if you think uh, living on $15,000 is uh, not living in poverty, go try it. All of us were pushed out. We didn't actually get a dollar a day, we still got our salaries back in Washington, but we were all pushed out to try to uh, you know, see how people in these communities uh, live. And I went out to uh, Ecuador to an indigenous community to, uh, 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 to see. And I have to say, initially, I was uh, very skeptical. 
you know, I'm from, uh, from Pakistan, born in Karachi. Uh, I've been around people who live in abject poverty uh, for large chunks of my life, but I wasn't actually living in that state. I wasn't living with them. I was living in a nice, comfortable house in a, uh, you know, good neighborhood in Karachi, if such a thing uh, exists, but uh, at least relatively uh, speaking. And it, um, it is a, um, uh, a life-changing experience. First of all, you get to understand that when uh, people talk about a village, they're actually talking about a fairly vast area in some places. So the village where I was in uh, Ecuador, the villagers would come to a clinic. Anything wrong with you? you come to a clinic. Well, that means you walk two days, two and a half days, something like that. There's only, clinics only open one day a month, so you've got to time it quite well. If you have bad luck and the health professional isn't there, you get to walk two and a half days back. So it's an expensive process uh, for them. And uh, you, know, you only come in a, uh, at a time of uh, real emergency. And the same goes on for almost every service. You know, the kids going to school are coming from long distances. You can never rely on people actually showing up, whether it's the school or the clinic. Forget about dentists. Uh, uh, you know, your, uh, the vagaries of the weather are uh, uh, extreme. It, it is a very punishing, brutal life where people are making decisions all the time about how to survive. Uh, and they're very difficult decisions, uh, but they make them very well. And at least in the development field, there's so much skepticism about, well, if these people actually had money, if they had resources, would they really know what to do with them? Wouldn't they just fritter it away? And people talk about uh, you know, cigarettes and alcohol and uh, other such things. And I, I, and I think those kinds of arguments just flow from uh, people who've never really seen the choices that people living in uh, real poverty uh, have to make on a uh, daily basis. It's absolutely inconceivable that they would be uh, wasting resources if they actually were able to, uh, uh, to get a few of them. Uh, so I think it is a, uh, uh, a very powerful experience to try to spend time in these kinds of communities. Thank you. Very well said. Elizabeth. Thank you very much, and a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, well, I've spent the better part of my career working in or around conflict zones or settings of real conflict or fragility. Um, and as you know, um, a large number of the world's extreme poor, in fact, over 50% of them live in those kinds of conditions. So I've had the very humbling experience of being around people living in quite desperate uh, circumstances. Um, I would give one example that was particularly formative uh, for me. Um, back in the 90s, I spent quite a lot of time in Haiti, going in for extended periods of time, uh, working on issues of political transition more than anything else. Uh, but I spent a fair amount of time in the north of Haiti, Capetien, the town Capetien, uh, a lot of very chronic and persistent and deep poverty uh, in, that, uh, in that town. Um, at the same time that I was there, I also met uh, a lieutenant colonel in the Pakistani army who happened to be the local commander of the UN peacekeeping battalion that was uh, stationed in the north of, of Haiti. And what was very striking about the interplay between this community uh, and uh, this Pakistani battalion, and this uh, lieutenant colonel in particular, he was there to preserve peace and stability. His immediate reaction was to try to understand what created instability in that community, to try to understand where were the pressures, what were the tensions, what was it that was creating some of the deep instability in the community. And what he immediately found, uh, and I'm telling this story because it's really about learning from him as much as, uh, as anything else, uh, he found that, of course, what was really at the root of quite a lot of people's difficulties uh, were issues of the school was broken down, the roads uh, were, under, were out of repair, uh, people weren't able to get their goods to market, uh, they didn't have access to the local justice officials when they desperately needed them. Uh, and 
he embarked on treating a peacekeeping task basically as a community development exercise. And most of the time that that particular battalion was stationed there, they worked on community development projects. They used their own sweat equity and their own just labor to work with the community on rebuilding schools, on rep uh, building an artificial reef so that the fishermen could go out and actually catch things without, uh, without uh, in any difficulty. Uh, and it was a very formative experience in trying to see how talking to people, very basic common sense thing, but trying to talk to people about what mattered to them, what was at stake for them, uh, gave them ideas for how, in a very basic way, to be able to be helpful and genuinely to contribute to, to, to that community. So that was an example that I would Wonderful. bring in. Secretary well, I have <clears throat> had a number of experiences, and um, I was thinking about this in terms of I was part of a UN commission on the legal empowerment of the poor that Hernando de Soto and I were co-chairing. And as a part of that, I went to Nairobi, to Kibera, the slum there. Uh, and there was a place called the Toy Market where, in fact, people were selling food and various pieces of things. And one of the aspects that came to me as a result, I spent a lot of time there, is... Um, just because you're poor doesn't mean you're stupid. And so these are people that had organized a way, and it has to do with what you're saying, in terms of really um, trying to figure out themselves how to get out of this and how to create a credit union and how to help each other in a variety of, of different ways. And um, the ingenuity and the entrepreneurship um, that poor people have um, in terms of trying to deal with their problems. It's not a matter of just sitting there and waiting to be helped by the international community, but to try to solve problems themselves. And, and I think that we need to uh, be supportive of that in terms of not just being uh, thinking of them as victims. One of the things that I find interesting and an anomaly is that uh, huge numbers, half the people in the world are hungry and the other half are buying diet books. Um, and the anomaly of that is what is so stunning to me. Um, I think that the number of poor people in the world is actually going down thanks to what the Chinese have done. But the gap between the rich and the poor is greater than ever. And I think that it's that gap that whether it's areas of conflict or you can't make a, a direct line between poverty and terrorism, but if you are completely alienated from your society and are getting nothing, uh, then you are much more recruitable. Uh, and so whether one deals with poverty as um, for a reason of humanity uh, or for national security purposes, I think it is one of the biggest problems that we have. And, and I think you're very right to ask us to talk about when we encountered uh, people that are desperately poor and what it is they do about it. And how, and how we figure out how to help them. But whether in areas of conflict, I had been in Haiti, I've been to Angola, I have been to Cambodia, wherever, and there are people who are not responsible for their poverty, they are the victims of it, and they are trying to figure out a way to uh, be contributing members to their society. And the truth is that that slum in Kibera and the people that were so ready to work and to try to figure out how to help each other was, for me, one of the most moving uh, moments that I've ever had. Well, thank you for raising the issue of, of inequality, uh, which uh, poses a, a bit of a, a dilemma for those advancing the sustainable development goals, because the sustainable development goals are intended to take us beyond the simple metric of per capita GDP, simple income measurements of of progress, they focus on elements of, of well-being, health and education and human dignity and, and nutrition and education. Uh, but of course, the, the risk is that as we make progress toward minimum standards in each of these areas, the income gap between those at the bottom that may be reaching the, reaching the minimum standards and those at the top uh, that income gap can actually grow, and it is growing, and it's likely to continue growing. Now, I know that uh, reducing inequality within and among nations is one of the sustainable development goals. I believe it's, it's number 10 out of 17. Uh, should, should reducing inequality have been goal number one? 
instead of number 10? Let me ask anyone who'd like to jump in. I, I actually think that it should have been number one because it creates a whole set of issues um, that are very hard to deal with the more they become embedded. And inequality comes from division of urban and rural, um, educated, uneducated, any number of different aspects in terms of opportunities, health, um, uh, hunger, and one could subsume a lot of the other aspects about it. But inequality is a cause of anger, um, despair, um, and a sense that you are not a part of uh, the human uh, family. And therefore, I do think it's, and it's something that President Obama has been addressing as we talk, but I think it's very hard to deal with in many ways because people pride themselves on, on being at the top, and when you're at the top, you often forget about the bottom, or you think, oh well, there are fewer of those kinds of people. That's what's happened with the metrics, if I might say so, because as people talk about, there are fewer poor people in the world in absolute numbers. I've just come back from China. There are fewer people. They have taken the equivalent of the American population out of poverty, but it doesn't mean that there's not inequality, even, or especially in China. Um, and I think that it makes us forget in terms of what the metrics are really, we, we satisfy ourselves thinking that there are fewer poor people. And there are, but the gap is larger and larger. Can I jump? Oh, we're, we're both jumping. No, go ahead, Part of what I was going to say is that I think one way to look at the whole aspiration for this Sustainable Development Goals framework, um, you're right, it's number 10 out of a proposed 17 at the moment. Um, there's not a ranking among them, and I think quite a lot of effort has gone into so far trying to think about ways that the goals speak to and reinforce one another. Uh, and when I think about almost every goal in that proposal, and uh, I might personally be variously attached to different ones, across the board there has been an effort to wire into those uh, an effort to reduce inequalities in various forms. So if you look, for example, uh, at proposed goal number five, which is equality and empowerment of women and girls. That's a huge, uh, a huge agenda that alone would make great headway against inequality in various forms if we're able to be quite serious about some of the targets that are proposed beneath that. Uh, some of the ways that uh, the poverty goal is formulated is very much not just about absolute poverty, but also about reducing inequalities. Um, so I think it's important to look at that as a, as a cross-cutting uh, sort of aspiration alongside uh, the standalone goal on inequality that, uh, that you mentioned. So I think that there are some, uh, uh, you know, very obvious uh, reasons why inequality is uh, uh, included in the uh, goals and uh, why it's a uh, reflection of uh, so many people's unhappiness with the current global system. But I have to say that there are uh, uh, at least a couple of technical reasons why it's extremely difficult to think about inequality as a goal. And the first of those reasons is that there are so many different types of inequality. Inequality is not a single thing. So unlike poverty, or at least income poverty, which is actually measured by one thing, inequality is all kinds of different things. You have discrimination that leads to inequality. You have rural-urban inequalities. You have uh, inequalities amongst um, you know, all kinds of different groups. You have inequalities that in many ways represent unfairness and differences in, uh, say, social mobility and your life chances. And then you have inequalities which are the result of luck, which are the result of hard work. So the, the outcome, the actual end point, is very difficult to understand exactly you know, what, it's, what it's from. So you've, you've got bad inequality, if you like, and you've got good inequality. And just looking at inequality doesn't help you separate between those two. And I think if you really want to address this as a goal, you've got to focus your attention much more on the bad inequality. And the difficulty is that that's extremely hard to, uh, uh, to measure. The, the, the other just observation uh, uh, I would have. We, we had a lot of discussion about inequality in the high-level panel. 
And the way in which these sort of UN-style processes uh, work is that uh, you know people sit according to the alphabetical ordering of their uh, country names. And as it happened, Sweden was sitting next to the United States in the uh, panel. So you can just imagine the discussion about inequality and what the goal, what should the right level of inequality be. And for the Swedes, it was a bit of a different number than for the US. And both thought that their societies were, you know, operating reasonably. Yes, there were changes they would like to make, but I can tell you neither would have said, we'd really like to be like you. So you can't easily set a single global standard for things like inequality. It's, 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 it's very much of a cultural phenomenon. It depends on things like the size of your country, the diversity of your country. Some countries are very homogeneous in terms of their uh, ethnic population. Others are much more uh, diverse. They're geographically diverse. All of those things go into what the, quote unquote, the the level of inequality that your society would want or will tolerate or would aspire to. So it's gonna be a different number for different countries. And if it's a different number for different countries, it's very hard to settle on a single target for the whole world. Whereas poverty, no problem. Especially if we define poverty on an absolute basis, which we do when we talk about extreme poverty, that applies everywhere in the world. You can set it as an absolute standard and make you know, a, a real effort to have international cooperation to uh, uh, help people uh, lift themselves out of poverty. Uh, let me ask a, a question from my vantage point as a scholar of, of international relations, a political scientist. Uh, the sustainable development goals are going to be debated and then, and then uh, embraced by the, Uni by the United Nations General Assembly next September. Now, most international relations scholars don't pay a lot of attention to the UN General Assembly. If they're political realists, many of them on the right, they'll argue that important outcomes in the world are driven by national governments, especially those with the biggest economies and the biggest military force. Um, scholars on the left will say outcomes are driven by, by multinational corporations or global finance, and governments do the bidding. Of, um, of, that, uh, of that structure of private interests. Uh, some liberal institutionalists will say, yes, there's a structure of, of, global, of global governance that, that's emerging, but uh, it takes the form of improved coordination among central banks or, or uh, maybe the World Trade Organization or the G20 or the UN special agencies, but not, but not the General Assembly. So if the General Assembly embraces the sustainable development goals, what assurance do we have that anything's going to change? Let me take that one, if I may. Um, if, or were you about to? Speak? No. Um, no, I think there is a great deal about the UN that is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and the UN can be a reflection of people's worst fears, their highest aspirations. And usually, when people think about the UN, uh, I think it's, it's a bit distant from what the reality of the United Nations is really about. The way I would look at this question right now is very pragmatically. Um, this is not about the General Assembly as a parliament. This is about a, an, a venue in which every country in the world comes together and has an opportunity to forge some agreements, some common commitments around some big ambitions. And the question is whether they want to do that or not, whether they want to do it politically, uh, whether they believe it's important enough to come to some kind of agreement together. And this is, this is not going to be a binding agreement that results. This is going to be an agenda that countries, individually and collectively, will decide whether they want to act on it. Uh, and as much as I've spent the better years working on on the negotiation side of this agenda, and we're all trying and striving in various ways for a very strong outcome at a summit in September where all heads of state and government will, will come, uh, hopefully to endorse a strong set of goals and targets. What really matters is what happens the next day. It's not about the words on the paper. It's not about the press releases that come uh, uh, in the immediacy of the summit. It's about in the next day, the next month, the next year, 
do ministries, do CEOs, do mayors, do communities, do citizens find something interesting in this agenda that they want to mobilize around that gives them a tool to use in their own context to try to make headway on some of these, these objectives. Some of them are truly global level uh, objectives that really require global level organization, but quite a lot of them are national and even local level uh, actions that will be required. And so that's really the test of whether it succeeds or not. And to me, the General Assembly is a place where people can come together to make those sorts of commitments, but it's what happens the next day that really counts. I, I have to say that I, I'm very, it's going to be the 70th anniversary of the creation of the UN. Um, and uh, I have always identified myself in many ways with the UN. I actually won the United Nations contest for the Rocky Mountain Empire uh, when I was um, a sophomore in high school. And the reason I was able to do it was that I <clears throat> was able to name the 51 countries that were members of the UN in alphabetical order. Um, there now are 197. If you sit in the General Assembly and you look down the list, it's really quite remarkable to see uh, the membership. I do think that um, the agenda setting that the, the General Assembly can do is very important and ultimately it has to be carried out individually. I think what is interesting, and you mentioned the number of groups that are involved, the UN is still based on the nation state system. And the nation states, and you sit there behind your sign, are not the only players. And I think that what has to happen in order to deal with this agenda is to figure out how the private sector uh, and the NGOs and all the various non-state actors can cooperate uh, so that it's a matter of bringing it up at the General Assembly, getting that kind of approval for it, and then figuring out uh, how the actions are carried out. And just the way that the MDGs have taken several years, this is going to be a fairly long-term effort. Um, Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and ends in an ism. But basically, it is a matter of trying to find international cooperation and partnership on issues that are hard to resolve. And these are perfect uh, examples of where setting that agenda multilaterally, I think, makes a difference. I think we should just think back to the uh, Millennium Development Goals which I think were really uh, quite successful in uh, many ways. And uh, let me just give a couple of examples of what happened afterwards. So first we got the formation of two really important new international institutions, uh, Gavi and the Global Fund, and the, uh, the uh, Global Alliance uh, for Vaccines and Immunization, and the Global Fund in the Fight Against AIDS, TB, and Malaria. We got them because Vaccinations had stalled. The rate of progress of vaccinations of kids around the world basically had stalled. Nobody was paying any attention. And suddenly people realized that these were interventions that could yield enormous benefits at relatively low cost. And they decided to actually do something about it. So there's this sense of development cooperation that can only happen when countries get together, talk about these issues, realize that there's something that can be uh, done, and do it. And I, I hope that the same thing will happen this time around. There'll be a number of these goals that will be discussed, and I would hope that there'll be some changes in what you might call the global development architecture. People will actually set up new institutions or ask existing institutions to do things a little bit differently to fill the gaps and to pay attention to things that have dropped off the radar screen. And then the second observation I would make is that before the Millennium Development uh, Goals and the uh, Millennium Declaration and the vision that's behind it, you had hundreds of uh, civil society organizations that were engaged in development. And they were all over the place. Their efforts were fragmented. They had, you know, each one had their own agenda. After the MDGs were uh, set, they coalesced around a common agenda. I think they've become enormously more effective because of that co uh, uh, 
ability to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, get together and collaborate around a few priority things. And I hope that this time round, we'll see exactly the same thing for business. You know, the solutions that we're going to have are going to come from businesses. It's going to come from innovation, Techn technological innovations, the science and research that businesses primarily do, and from business model innovations, the ability to actually extend markets down to places and people where normally markets don't reach because it's just not worth it. Then, you know, the markets aren't big enough, the profit margins aren't big enough. So you have literally hundreds of millions of people who are excluded from a normal market economy. And it's very difficult to have real development without a market economy. So if we can get businesses also thinking in exactly the same way what needs to be done to build food security, to have clean energy, to have uh, safe drinking water, then I think there's a chance of actually achieving some of these uh, goals. So, so it's, it's not what happens in the UN. It's the idea that the world is behind a certain set of, you know, hopefully reasonably limited big things, and then everybody else can organize themselves behind that. Okay, thanks. I'd like to ask a, um, a question to Secretary Albright about politics in the United States when it comes to development assistance in particular. When you were Secretary of State, you had to fight hard against opponents of foreign assistance, particularly in the Senate, to keep the program going. Um, we face similar opposition today. If the SDGs stand any hope of getting support from the United States is going to have to include substantial appropriations that are under the control of the United States Congress. Uh, what's the best way to persuade Congress of the value of that kind of spending? Is it to uh, appeal to their sense of, of urgency by saying how large the problems are? We still have 800 million hungry people. Or is it to show them how much progress has been made and to convince them that we know the money will be well spent, we have programs that work if they're adequately funded? Or can you do both at the same time? Or do you have to pull some other trick out of your hat in order to get dead-end opponents of foreign assistance to appropriate the money? Well, first of all, um, I have always advocated that one should stop calling it foreign assistance because those are two words going together that don't appeal to people foreign and assistance. Um, and that depending upon with whom you are speaking, I think you have to argue it in different ways. I know that some of the development people never like this, but I think it needs to be called national security support uh, because people salute to that. And I really do think that an awful lot of our national interests depend upon what is going on in other countries in terms of their stability and their capability of dealing with their particular issues. I think also what has to happen is um, to motivate businesses. I think that plays a very huge role because um, I, I now spend a lot of time in the private sector and basically there is um, it's a win-win situation because, as you said, there are a lot of places where um, businesses can do well, uh, and it is, um, you know, Benjamin Franklin doing well by doing good. And so I think that there are ways to motivate. And frankly, I am part of a coalition of um, working with Colin Powell and Tom Ridge and various people in terms of trying to explain that this is not a partisan matter, that this is good for the United States. The problem is that people don't have facts. And um, there, if you were to do a poll and ask people how much of our budget goes for foreign assistance, they would say one quarter of the budget. And then you say, well, you know, what would you be okay with? And they said, well, like 10%. The truth is it's less than 1%. So it's ludicrous, this argument. Um, and I think that one has to argue it on the basis of that this is good for America given especially some of the composition of who is there now. Um, and the bottom line, and I would argue it also, in, I, I can argue this however you want, um, with immigration, 
that people would prefer not to come to this country if, in fact, they could make a living where they are. Um, and therefore, any number of different ways that this needs to be argued, because we are the richest country in the world, and there has to be a way to do this. I also believe that part of it is sustainability in the programs. We are the most generous people in the world with the shortest attention span. And the bottom line is there are some countries that really need to have a multi-year commitment. And that is the hardest part in terms of our budget process, uh, of trying to get um, multi-year commitments wherever. But I think it's absolutely essential that Americans understand what we get out of this. Um, and, and so one has to do it. I prefer to do it on a humanitarian basis and say that this is the right thing to do and why should people, just because they live somewhere else, live like dogs. The bottom line is that a lot of it is in our national interest and I think that's the way it needs to be argued. You know, I'm glad you mentioned um, immigration. Uh, some scholars believe that the most efficient way we have to increase the income of poor communities abroad and to equalize incomes between rich and poor is to open our borders to more labor migration. Is, is free labor migration one of the sustainable development goals? Was there a debate over including a large immigration component in the SDGs? I think that uh, uh Free immigration, uh, at least in the uh, uh, discussions that I was part of, was never really um, uh, part of the goals. What is part of the goals is the uh, treatment of migrants. And uh, uh, extending to uh, migrants uh, the kind of uh, rights that uh, one would uh, hope that every citizen in the world should be uh, able to uh, uh, avail of. But I think that there was an understanding that uh, it would be extremely difficult to craft an international agreement on uh, uh, the free movement of uh, people. Especially now. Especially now. Uh, I think that that is harder and harder, given that we don't know who everybody is. And uh, I think, but the treatment of migrants is very important in it's terms of uh, many of whom become kind of the international homeless. Can I just jump in quickly on the financing question? Because sure. I think. One of the big stories in all of this conversation, huge story and questions and debate about official development assistance. How best to spend it, how much should it be, how do you mobilize it from whom, et cetera. But a huge story is also about domestic resource mobilization. So basically, what can countries capture fiscally in resources in their own societies to spend on development? And how do you maximize the development impact of those flows? Big conversations about illicit flows. How do you do more? Uh, to, to retain resources within countries that are otherwise uh, flowing in other places. Um, and that's coming from developing countries. That's a, a big demand for much more creative attention to how you support them in being able to mobilize their own resources, which already dramatically dwarf, in even the poorest countries, dwarf official development assistance. Uh, so I think the larger question is how do you mobilize from the widest spectrum of, of sources, flows that have the most developmental impact. Just okay. to think, yes. sort of uh, chip in on this, I mean, the, I, th I think this is why this particular exercise is actually uh, often called the beyond aid agenda, because I think people realize it's not really just about aid any longer in the same way that the MDGs were, and that there are many far more important, uh, uh, even, even financing um, uh, policies that can be put in place to help retain resources in uh, developing countries. And you, you have to remember, on a net basis, money is actually flowing not from rich countries to poorer countries, but money is flowing from poor countries to rich countries. You know, people talk about money flowing uphill. And that's basically because of the policies that we have in place right now that govern global capital flows. And without a reversal of uh, that, it's going to be extremely difficult to uh, make the uh, sustainable development goals work. And so I think a lot of the effort actually will have to come on the policy side rather than just on the uh, uh, financing side. 
Well, uh, thank you. I, I hope we've stimulated um, some thinking and some questions from the hall. We're going to open it up now for, for questions. There are microphones that are being positioned in the aisles, and we would like to first invite uh, Albright Fellows to uh, jump to the head of the line. Uh, those of you who have questions that, uh, that you'd like to pose, others can wait a decent interval and then uh, line up as well. We'll alternate between this aisle and that aisle. Uh, I can't see as well uh, looking in your direction as you can see looking in mine, but I'll, I'll do my best to make sure I know when someone has stepped to the microphone. When you're, when you're at the microphone, please take just a moment to identify yourself and say a bit about your affiliation, and then uh, uh, give us your short question. Uh, questions, please. You, uh, you can make a statement, but it has to be disguised as a question. So, <laughs> so please go ahead. Hello, my name is Priyanka Fuda, and I am an Albright Fellow. Um, my question was about uh, scaling up. And so the idea of if we want to reduce poverty, we want to be able to deliver services like roads or healthcare or sanitation. So how do we think about scaling these things up? And also, I guess this also can be in part a financing question, but also in just um, scaling up vital services. Would you like to direct your question to any one particular <laughs> panelist? Um, I, I, I guess I anyone. Someone, I think someone who had long experience at the World Bank should be qualified to answer that question. Um, I actually uh, wrote a book called Getting to Scale. <laughs> <laughs> you know, scale, scale is the name of the game because when we talk about anything, now at the global level, you know, we're still talking about a billion people living in extreme poverty. We're talking about two and a half billion people without access to bank accounts. We're talking about uh, billions of people without access to electricity or uh, sanitation. Uh, so these, these numbers are very big. And I think that what that means, you know, I, I think the, the, the way to think about scale is to try to break it down into uh, uh, two parts. One is the delivery part, and the other is the financing part. So on the financing part, um, it basically means you can't do it just on the basis of ODA or grants or something like that, because those are limited in resources. If you want to get to scale, you've got to have a model where resources are coming in. So you can use grants or other forms of public capital to pay for your upfront capital costs, if you can then build a business model where the recurrent costs cover the operating costs. And that turns out to be true in lots and lots of areas that we think of as being classic public services, you know, including things like water. But I think there's been a a, a real problem has been that we continue to think that the only people who can take something to scale is the public sector. And to be honest, if we're going to wait for the public sector in most developing countries, we're going to wait a very long time indeed. So I'm much more comfortable with thinking about having organizations or companies drive to scale with these kinds of new business models, and you have lots of really interesting and exciting examples of people who are using new technologies and basically digital information systems which cut costs so dramatically to now be able to think about all kinds of uh, uh, scalable platforms. And in pretty much any area you can think of, whether it's education or health or uh, information flows to farmers, agricultural extension, anything, uh, there are uh, models of how you can get to uh, scale. Well, I, I do think the concept of public-private partnerships in this, so for instance, when President Obama does Power Africa, which is certainly delivering, then you need the private sector to go into places in order to uh, follow up on it. And I'm a great believer now in public-private partnerships on this. 
Okay, we have someone at this microphone. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for a very stimulating panel. My name is Laley Mapayan, and I'm the executive director of the Wellesley Centers for Women here at Wellesley College. And I'm going to ask a question that's still sort of formulating in my mind, but maybe it goes back to my background as a developmental psychologist by training. And that is that there is very much a psychological component to development and to meeting the kinds of um, goals and targets that the um, sustainable development goals are encapsulating. There's still a lot of hatred and hostility in the world based on groups and identities. How do we deal with that? Because in some respects, inequalities are caused by hatreds. Sometimes inequalities themselves cause the hatreds. I mean, there's a bi-directional relationship, but there's very much a psychological component that we somehow have to bring in to remove hatreds and hostilities from our global community. How do we think about that? What comments can you offer on that particular piece of the puzzle? Can you once again direct a question to uh, your favorite? I don't know why I'm volunteering for this because it's a very hard question. Um, but, but one thing I would say, I think um, throughout all of the conversations, that, at least that I've been uh, part of over the last couple of years of how to think about, uh, about these goals, first of all, there's, a, there's an increasingly deep and, uh, and, and shared uh, commitment to really thinking carefully about individuals in their context. People-centered development is one term that people use, um, but being, trying to be quite thoughtful about that below, below the slogan. And to be able to think about how, how it is that development happens in ways that are meaningful to individual groups. Uh, and to think about um, issues of exclusion in particular. I think I've been struck by how, as, as politically challenging as issues of exclusion can be in many different contexts, uh, for now the last couple of years, there's been quite a candid conversation about uh, about how different countries and communities handle issues of inclusion, whether it's inclusion of uh, indigenous groups, migrants, uh, women, uh, other disenfranchised members of a population. So it gets a little bit at the questions of the tensions that, uh, that you're trying to describe. But the other thing I would say is that a lot of us have put quite a lot of emphasis in this conversation on issues of governance. We'll want to speak to uh, as well. Um, and governance questions, governance institutions, goes very directly to creating the conditions in which I think people are feel safer, feel more mutually confident, are able to uh, have the opportunities sometimes to deal with some of the difficult questions. I'm not a fan, I'm not a, uh, an adherent of the school of um, hatred drives conflict. I think that uh, misunderstands sometimes the conditions in which people come to conflict with one another. Um, but I think governance and institutions have a great deal to do with it. And so the emphasis that quite a lot of us have put on issues of access to justice, issues of non-discrimination, there are quite a lot of targets in this proposal that go to issues of violence and non-discrimination, and a lot of uh, the, the, the reasons that you, you raised are the reasons why. It's pretty obvious why you chose to answer the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi there. I'm Emma Ambrogi. I'm an Albright Fellow. You all spoke about the need to mobilize the private sector in achieving the sustainable development goals, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how you do that, how you convince a business that something that won't necessarily show returns in the yearly budget is worth doing for a big corporation. Well, I, I believe the following thing, which is that big corporations, uh, global ones especially, need to be local in order to exist. And in order to exist locally, um, they have to see themselves as part of the community. And to um, this is where doing good by doing well. For instance, I, I find an interesting company, Coca-Cola, for instance, it can't exist without local bottlers and using local water, and clearly there are a variety of problems involved in that. But it does require them to see things from a local perspective. So for instance, they just opened a company uh, in Burma. And in order to, it employs a lot of people, it's a joint venture, they gave money to women's groups there. And so I think that it's whatever, whether one calls it social responsibility or whatever, but the, our big or multinationals have to be local. I think that, that is kind of the, the mantra for it in order to make it work. Very few academic studies actually suggest that there is a big trade-off 
between long-term profits and social and environmental sustainability practices of those corporations. And so I think many uh, you know, good management managers of businesses tend to have all of the above. The problem seems to come in to when uh, managers are actually forced to focus on short-term profits and short-term profit maximization. And so one trend that you see is some companies just are stopping to do that kind of quarterly reporting. You know, even big companies, including Coca-Cola, Nestle, uh, uh, Unilever, uh, others. So I think that there are now uh, efforts both from the managers of corporations and there are efforts from shareholders to, uh, you know, start to uh, put pressure on companies to look at long-run profit maximization. So particularly big companies that are, you know, in the game to stay and want to have a focus on long-term profit maximization don't find that there's really a big trade-off between that and sustainability practices. Thank you, I'm Zoe Moyer and I am an Albright Fellow. Um, so I want to thank uh, Priyanka because I think she was getting at this, but we've been hearing a lot about theory and I just want to know or hear a little bit more about your proposed applications. Uh, so for instance, uh, during the Institute, we heard or uh, we had a uh, crash course in public speaking from Barbara Tenenbaum. And one of the things that she said uh, was that we need to learn how to sell what we're saying uh, to, to our crowd, um, to the, peop the audience that we have in mind. And so I would like to get back to Secretary, Secretary Albright's uh, suggestion that uh, foreign assistance should be called national security support. And I was wondering if, you know, just taking that example, for instance, how we might be able to actually apply that and how um, it, something like that could actually be used. Well, it depends on the audience that you're speaking to. Um, but I do think that we have to choose better ways of describing what we do. And generally um, play to the fact that there is self-interest and national interest and self-interest and trying to gauge the audience. I actually think that getting away from short-term reporting is a very interesting aspect of this. But I do think that words make a difference and um, people like to hear things that are summarize issues well, that are able to state things uh, pungently and briefly, but you do have to uh, gauge the audience to which you're speaking. And one of the hard parts is that you never have just one audience. So I can tell you, because I've tried this, the, de the real development people hate it when I say national security support. Um, you know, that, right? Right. Um, <laughs> but if you're talking to Lindsey Graham or whoever, uh, you might want to frame it that way. Hi, my name is Nikita Salati. I'm a current Albright Fellow. And I have a question for Dr. Karas about some, one of the last points that you made. And um, you mentioned that global capital flows are really important in the way development occurs. And many of those policies that um, govern global capital flows or the decisions that go into where money is going um, are really determined by the biggest global powers. And um, so with uh, a, an organization like the UN um, and with the SDGs coming up, how, how can we change those policies and how are those policies being changed in order to make sure that the flows are become more equitable? So I think that what the UN does is provides a platform where countries can get together and commit, make a political commitment to actually doing something. But the UN isn't always going to be the place which will implement those recommendations. So take the issue of uh, tax evasion and uh, profit shifting by multilaterals. Most of the technical work on that is being done by the uh, OECD. And uh, so, you know, rich countries who are now starting to see that this isn't just a problem of multinational corporations shifting their profits out of developing countries, they're also shifting their profits out of developed countries and putting them all into 
the Cayman Islands and uh, you know other such uh, places. So you know tax havens, beneficial ownership, all these things had suddenly become high on the agenda for everyone. Everybody's now in the business of trying to uh, figure out how to uh, uh, make the global tax system a little bit uh, more fair and appropriate and linked to where companies actually do business rather than where they uh, uh, simply uh, 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 shift their, pro their, uh, um, their, their profits. Or take the issue of um, bribery. There is an OECD convention. Every country has signed on to a convention against bribery and uh, corruption. The problem is with the implementation. And uh, you know, so politically, it's still way, way too easy for corrupt people, whether they're in developing countries or developed countries, to be able to stash their money in an account. And I can assure you that account is not in Mali. Uh, you know, they're holding their money in the most reputable banks in the world, and it's just purely a matter of implementation on the part of the authorities. So when you have a, pol a global political commitment to do something about this, something can be done. So I, I think that these have just been things that have been left a little loose, shall I say, for some time, because they weren't really a problem for everyone. One of the really important things that's happening with these sets of goals is they're being presented as being universal goals. And more and more people are seeing that a weakness in the system here is having an impact there. These are no longer things that are just problems for people overseas. And uh, I, I would uh, uh, suggest to Secretary Albright that it's not just it's not foreign assistance because it's no, longer, it's no longer foreign. The sustainable development goals are going to be universal. They're going to apply in the United States. And it's not assistance. It's really an investment in the kind of world that we want. So, you know, I, I view moments like this as being get people together and make political commitments where it's, it's, it's not that the, to be honest, this, this stuff is not really rocket science. People pretty much know, you know what the big ticket items are and how we could you know, literally change the flows of billions of dollars. It's a matter of getting a political agreement to actually go out there and do it. Are, are the SDGs going to be seen as universal uh, by the Chinese? Oh, absolutely. Uh, even though the Chinese model was not based upon the protection of natural resources or transparency or... I think the Chinese regret that enormously, and I think that they are probably doing now more than almost any other country in the world to reverse it. So their investments in renewables technology is uh, huge. I think that the uh, agreement that was crafted between the bilateral agreement between the U.S. and China uh, what, two, two months ago or uh, so, uh, you know, is very important. And it wasn't just on renewables. It was on guidelines for um, plurilateral, plurilateral negotiations on uh, export credit uh, agencies. So how will the China Exim Bank actually operate in some of these countries? It was an agreement to cooperate on uh, research in uh, food security and um, uh, food practices. So I think, the, I think the large stakeholders in the global economy and, uh, you know, by and large, the countries in the G20 are taking this reasonably uh, seriously and do see places where they can have a common agenda. Good afternoon, Charlotte Weiss, Albright Fellow. I had a question for Secretary Albright. You had mentioned migrants as the international homeless, and I was wondering if you could speak about the future of immigration policy within international development and whether the focus will be on the countries that these migrants are coming from or on their integration into the countries that they're migrating to. I think that um, it depends on which country. I do think that in many ways, Migration has been set back um, in, first of all, migrants are created 
partially by climate change and conflicts in a variety of ways, different ways. But given uh, what I now call the fear factor, I think that, in fact, it is a problem that's going to get worse before it gets better. There are, whether one calls them migrants or refugees or displaced people, um, I think there is a real issue in terms of open borders and trying to figure out what the right policies are. One of the aspects that one has to deal with is that many of the countries that are having economic problems have an aging population and they actually need younger people uh, to be able to carry the load. And the previous issue about um, uh, the question about hatreds and ethnic groups, uh, you tend to blame some ethnic group for your economic problems. And so there are any number of aspects of this that I think have become more and more complicated. Uh, and certainly this country is... An, I'm an immigrant, uh, and a very grateful one. And, um, and I do think, not to be self-serving here, but immigrants actually have not been so bad for this country. Uh, and so the bottom line is that... What has made America great is the diversity. And, um, and I do think President Obama stated that brilliantly at the end of the State of the Union message. But I think it's going to be hard. And it's harder now as a result of fear of who is who and why are they moving and what are their um, intentions generally and their behavior. Hi, my name is Melanie Chen, and I'm an Albright Fellow. And I was wondering, you were talking a lot about um, forging public and private partnerships. And I was wondering if you could speak a little about how you balance the interests between all the parties involved, where the emphasis should be placed. Because when you include more and more parties, there is bound to be like a greater chance for conflict. Well, I, I do think that... Um, First of all, it's very important to listen to different stakeholders. They come at it with different ideas, and uh, I find it very innovative. But you have to be willing to listen and try to deal with what the stakeholders uh, have in mind and what they bring to the table. And this is where our current system is complicated, because we are not used to dealing with those that have a, a short-term uh, a, a bottom line that they have to answer or shareholders who want something. Not, I hate to say this, but not all NGOs are white hats. You know, not everybody has um, nothing but good humanitarian instincts. And so the issue is trying to figure out how you blend this difference in terms of people's interests. But I think we are strengthened in this day and age as we are looking for institutional structures to go beyond the nation state and to have the private sector there. We, maybe it's only because I now am not in the public sector, but more the private sector, that you can really see what comes with the innovative spirit of the private sector and the willingness to, uh, to take chances. But you have to listen, and it's much more complicated. There's no question it's much more complicated with stakeholders, different stakeholders, and the negotiations are more prolonged and it's a messier process, but it ultimately, I think, uh, brings more vitality to solving the problems. Can I just add briefly yes. to that? I think there's been a tremendous amount of innovation in recent years, even in the UN context, on public-private partnerships. And where that has worked the best is when it's organized around a specific problem. So it's not saying, let's create you know, an architecture of different actors, and then we'll go find a problem to solve. It very much starts from specific problems in need of a solution, and then figuring out who has the expertise, who has the resources, who has a stake, who has an interest in really some sustained work together in trying to solve that problem. Um, there's been tremendous work on maternal and child health, for example, that was set up, initiated a few years ago by the Secretary General to try to pull together, again, to use the UN as a convening platform, not in a grand governance sense, but just as a space where people who have an interest in a common set of problems can really try to figure out what they can each do to be part of a solution. That's played out at the country level as well as at the global level. Also on sustainable energy, is something very, very similar. Uh, so I think it is very much a going mode of trying to get practical actions from a variety of different, different players. And it will look very different in different countries and in different sectors. What will look like in maternal health will be very different from energy or infrastructure. So, 
Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jessica Shin and I wanted to thank you all for coming and speaking with us today. So I wanted to touch a little bit about the idea of getting the private sector and investing into these local economies where you see a lot of poverty. I wanted to know where you guys drew the line between um, investing overseas as opposed to investing in our own borders. And that's a heat of contention because a lot of people are worried about outsourcing jobs to those areas that have a lot of poverty, but wondering when, when, is, when is it important for us to stop looking overseas and start fixing what's here at home? First of all, you can do both and this is what has to happen. We need to create more jobs here, but there have to be people in other countries that will buy whatever it is we produce. And therefore, <clears throat> there is a symbiotic relationship in this. Uh, and as we are more and more a global society, which we are, then I do think that one gains by investing in both at home and abroad. People are investing, though, and this has to do with governance. One of the discussions that I've been involved in recently. Americans, America is now one of the, the largest places for foreign investment. Why do they invest here? Because basically our governance is better than others in terms of tax laws and a variety of different aspects. So what has to happen is understanding that there is a relationship between a foreign market and a domestic market and that the United States is better off when other countries are more stable and we are not worrying as to what uh, various conflicts, ethnic conflicts, are doing in coming home to America. So I believe in investing in both, and we are able to do both. Hi, I'm Sarah Guntarik, an Albright Fellow, and I have a question for Mr. Karas. Um, so in the project that my group for the Albright Institute did, uh, we were working on water and we interviewed several community leaders who felt that their communities and their countries in the Global South on the whole were not, uh, not did not benefit uh, from the privatization clauses in loan conditionality and, and sort of incentivizing uh, bringing private enterprise in that way. I guess, what are some of the biggest lessons and takeaways from past policies uh, of the World Bank and other institutions, and how might a role be created to bring in private enterprise in a different way going forward? So I think that um, consultation among stakeholders, and particularly those who are supposedly the beneficiaries of whatever service you're trying to offer, is uh, uh, quite critical. And so uh, you've, um, uh, you've had the privatization of some um, uh, water systems, largely, largely in municipalities where it's easier to uh, uh, actually charge people for, uh, uh, for water. Um, but these are very complicated contracts. They're not always done fairly. The legal structures aren't always um, uh, clear, nor is there fairness in some sense in, in terms of the, the legal heft between the two parties that are negotiating the uh, contracts. So there's, there's a great deal of unevenness in uh, these things. And um, I, I, I think that um, it's, it's useful to try to make these as transparent as possible so that people can easily identify why it is that there's a difference. You know, why does this company, for example, have the right to, say, raise water tariffs, whereas in a similar kind of project somewhere else they don't? Why is it costing so much uh, here, whereas in uh, somewhere else it costs uh, less? So the more we can get transparency in these kinds of contracts, I think the fairer that they will uh, become. And there are, you know, I think uh, interesting and useful um, uh, examples now of where uh, uh, lawyers, many times pro bono, are willing to, uh, you know, offer their services to uh, communities to uh, try to make sure that the uh, contracts that are negotiated are fair. So, yeah, I, you know, I think this is an area where there have been problems. Um, I think that they're problems that can be fixed. Uh, but I think we also have to 
always think about what's the alternative. And in some places, the alternative is maybe you've got a government that will be able to come in and deliver the service. There's nothing that I have against that. Uh, but in many instances, it's going to be just business as usual. And what is business as usual? Business as usual is usually somebody coming with a uh, truck and you know people living in slums paying huge amounts for water. Um, so water, water, water tends to be very expensive. Clean water tends to be very expensive for uh, uh, a lot of people. But I'm also hopeful that there'll be lots more you know, local, simple solutions. And that's one of the things that technology is uh, bringing. Uh, you now have the ability to get clean water out of a, uh, like a rural pump. There's one company that is based in Denmark that delivers clean water in rural Kenya by basically using a smart fob. Somebody you know, pays money from Impesa, an electronic transfer into uh, that, and they put it on the uh, little terminal, and out comes one liter of clean water. And hopefully, you've got a jug to catch it in, and, uh, take it back. So, you know, I think there are lots of solutions to these kinds of things. I think that, especially when you're dealing with basic services, you've got to be very careful about the uh, operators that are involved. Um, but I, 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 I hope that things are uh, uh, improving and that we're learning lessons about how to do this uh, more effectively. We're, we're running a little short of time, but we have four questioners here who've been waiting patiently. I don't want any one of them to sit down without a chance to put their thinking uh, uh, to the panel. So if you would each just very quickly uh, pitch your questions. And we'll then give the panelists one last round to respond to any or all of the questions that, uh, that are on the table. So please go ahead and identify yourselves once again. My name is Kara Hundle. I'm a first year here. Um, I really want to become an astrophysicist, and at the same time, I really want to become you, each and every one of you. <laughs> and it's such a hard decision to make. <laughs> Hey, I really, really, I think everyone in this room needs to hear this answer. I want one of you to recall a very specific moment where you thought you could be stopped. And I want you to explain to everyone how you pulled through it and how you are in these chairs right now. You're thinking about that while the other questions are being put on the table. Thank you very much. Would you like me to sit down? I, would, I think that's a big question that needs to be thought about before it's answered. Okay. Yes. We'll, we'll just hear all four questions, okay. but that one will not be ignored. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. I'm Emma King. I'm also a first year here. I was just wondering, in terms of property rights for locals in certain countries where those property rights are not necessarily protected, how can we make sure that those... Uh, people gain rights over the land that they've been living on or their family has been living on for generations? And how would you implement that in countries and create a certain set of rules to determine how those rights are then enforced and put into place? Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Yanka Batia. I'm also a first year. Thank you so much for being here. It's so inspiring. Um, one of you spoke about the need, I guess all of you spoke about the need for um, multi-year political commitments between nations in terms of development. My question pertains to extraction. How do you know when your commitment as a nation has been fulfilled and you should let the local private sector take over? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm from China, and um, Sigrid Albright mentioned about how the population living under poverty is generally decreasing, but the income gap is becoming greater than ever. And one thing I noticed since I came here that pains me is that people back home, especially people who are rich, seems not to be as passionate and active about bringing something back to their community and helping others. So my question is how to get the conversation started among people, not just within the government or between governments. And because I think the mere fact that we're talking about poverty and inequality here, that we have the will to talk about it and to, to do something about it, even if the solution may not be effective, is important. Okay, thank you. Those are 
those are uh, two uh, important technical questions sandwiched between some very uh, large and uh, difficult to answer uh, questions. I'll let the panelists choose which uh, they'd like to respond to, but we shouldn't first forget that first question. What, personally, what keeps you going uh, when you would otherwise be discouraged? And this is a field where you encounter many setbacks and a great deal of frustration. So in those circumstances, what keeps you going? And we'll just go from Homi to Elizabeth to Secretary Albright. The um, exercise of putting together the high-level panel report was, uh, I would say, not an easy process, and uh, one where uh, there were several moments where it was quite unclear whether or not we would get to a uh, successful conclusion. Um, people think that only maybe one in three of these high-level panels are um, actually successful, so the probabilities are not always in your uh, favor. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's actually quite common in any kind of uh, uh, negotiation process and creative process where you've got lots of different uh, points of view uh, to go through uh, uh, to go through a real roller coaster ride, and um, the uh, so the you know I, I I think at the end of the day you've got a fairly simple um, uh, a simple choice to make. You either stay on the train and realize that either you'll come back up or you crash, or you can choose to leave, which in some sense is a crash already. So, uh, you know, it's not that, uh, uh, that tricky a uh, choice at the end of the day to uh, make. And I think the, um, what makes for the difference between one or the other uh, is uh, very largely luck. Uh, I don't think that there's anything uh, systematic about these uh, things. I think it's luck and the personalities around the uh, table who, uh, you know, sometimes uh, decide we, you know, We'd rather not have a train crash, uh, and uh, uh, sometimes they decide that uh, they actually would prefer a uh, train crash. And uh, so, uh, uh, in the, in the panel report, there were actually uh, uh, several newspaper articles suggesting that we were imminently about to have a—I uh, 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 think it was a car crash, not a train crash. Uh, um, but uh, I, I, think it's, uh, uh, I think it's kind of unpredictable. Let me just touch on the exit strategies. Um, especially for uh, lots of agencies today are facing this question, development agencies are facing this question about exit strategies. And uh, in, in many ways, it actually links to the scaling up uh, uh, question. Because the answer to when you can exit is when you have in place a dynamic and a momentum that's actually taking to scale the solution to the problem that you're trying to solve. So if you take an agency like the Global Fund from the fight against AIDS, TB, and malaria, you know, they work in lots of countries around the world. Some of them are uh, very sophisticated uh, countries like, um, uh, like China or uh, South Africa, there, where there were some in, at least in the case of South Africa, some real political difficulties and acceptance of the, uh, the, both of the problem and of the uh, solutions, but once those had been overcome and mechanisms had been demonstrated and the uh, results had been uh, shown so that you had a model, they were perfectly capable and able to take things on themselves and essentially uh, you know, uh, run from there. So, uh, it's a, I, I think it's a question that ought to be on the minds of every development practitioner and every program should think about both how we're going to get to scale and in that process of getting to uh, scale, how do we actually uh, uh, exit from uh, what we do. The discouragement question. Now, there's no such thing as getting discouraged at the United Nations. We just go from victory to victory to victory. It's all, it's really all one big gratifying job every day. Um, um, but what I, uh, so there is a, a reasonable amount of it. But I'm going to give a really different answer to homies, even though I think Lutke's right is, uh, is, is not unremoved from, from outcomes. Uh, and I'll just reflect a little bit on the process um, that, I, that I've just been working on uh, with these SDGs. Um, I was, when you, we started that process, uh, if you'd said, could a group of 193 countries sit together for a year and come up with anything 
vaguely logical, vaguely coherent, vaguely in common? Could they even understand what a goal or a target was or have the same definition? Uh, to come out with a working proposal that has its warts, doesn't have agreement from everybody by a long margin, is probably too long and too complicated, um, but to come out with something that reasonably reflects shared parameters and shared commitments from a wide variety of very diverse countries. You asked the China question earlier, and I think uh, my Chinese colleagues uh, would be able to say at a basic level they share the same foundational objectives that we do about global development. We may have very different ideas at times about how to do that, what issues should come first, but not actually as different as you think. Um, and what I, at the, in the darkest moments, and there are a lot of very dark moments when you're in the basement of the United Nations trying to negotiate, uh, sometimes the lights literally go off at times. Um, what has always made me feel deeply inspired about the possibility of success have been delegates from other countries who speak very powerfully about their own experience. And I will just give two very quick examples. One is hearing Pacific Island colleagues on the subject of climate change, who when they talk about the existential threat of climate change, it's very, very real for a low-lying island with a small population. And that's very moving and makes you realize that it's important even when you're discouraged to get up again. Uh, and the other is listening from countries to countries like Liberia and Timor-Leste about peace and governance and why those issues matter to them as a development matter. Deeply passionate, deeply real, authenticated with evidence every single time. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that makes you want to get up and keep going even when some of the forces are arrayed in the other direction. You'll be surprised, but I will answer the first question last. I will now address myself to property rights. Um, and I'll tell you why, because <clears throat> what was interesting is, and it's a perfect example of, in my case, of always trying to find something interesting in whatever I'm asked to do. And what happened was Hernando de Soto, of whom I've spoken before, wrote a book called The Mystery of Capitalism, in which he talked about the fact that their poor people in societies uh, actually own the land that they're working, they just don't have the piece of paper that proves it. And therefore, they don't have the rights that go with it, they're not able to monetize it, and it goes to the question of how you <clears throat> deal with property. So he asked me to co-chair a commission with him uh, that ultimately ended up with four baskets to it. One was property rights, one was labor rights, business rights, and legal empowerment of the poor, access to justice. And I think that what is interesting is a very good example. It ultimately ended up as a, a General Assembly resolution based on work done at the UN Development Program that really put those issues together and understood how they fit together. There is a way that uh, property rights uh, are essential in terms of being able to prove that you've got this piece, this piece of land and that you can develop it. And it's also proven that when people actually have ownership of their land, they are more likely to work it and to really put more effort into it. So I do think property rights are very important. And as Ashraf Ghani, who, believe it or not, was also part of this commission, now as president of Afghanistan, is saying that property rights are a very important part of making that place work because he understood he'd also been at the World Bank and a number of different aspects of putting these pieces together. So it may surprise you, but I know a lot about property rights. It goes to the answer to the first question. I could not be an astrophysicist if I spent my entire life trying to do that. But the bottom line for me that has always been, what doesn't stop me is the harder it is because I will really believe, that, and will always believe, that we have a purpose here to work hard and to deliver. Uh, and the harder it is, the more likely it is that you will feel satisfaction from it. And the minute somebody says you can't do it, is, except being an astrophysicist, um, I would really work on it. And I think that being asked to do something on property rights, for instance, because I was asked, I think it was something which was worth putting um, time into and not being stopped. And I always tell people, don't bet against me. And so the bottom line, I think that what puts people somewhere is the desire to make a difference and then ultimately to be grateful. 
I am so grateful for every single thing that has ever happened to me. Going to Wellesley is a part of it. And I think that what motivates me is to give back. And so the proof of the pudding here today, if I might say so, these Albright fellows, the questions have been remarkable. Um, and I think that it really shows that those of us that put into efforts on behalf of others in some form or another can deal with inequality, can deal with a variety of the issues that are out there that we have to deal with. And the harder it is, the harder we have to work, and therefore we can't be stopped. And 1959 Wellesley Ra, 1959 Wellesley. We were, we were out of time about five minutes ago, but I'm glad we had a chance to get those last questions and to get the excellent responses to those last questions. And thanks in part to the superb questions from the Albright Fellows. Uh, our panelists have given us, I think, uh, a remarkably uh, candid and comprehensive and, uh, and committed and savvy uh, look at this important sustainable development goals process. So between now and next, and next September, um, you all are going to be able to watch and uh, listen and learn and explain to others uh, what's going on with a great deal more background and information uh, than, than most folks around. So we're very grateful for our three guests to have uh, spent this time uh, with us to have come to Wellesley or back to Wellesley and uh, help uh, keep alive what I think is a wonderful tradition of uh, the Albright Institute uh, public dialogue. Uh, so thanks to you all and thanks also to those in the audience. <laughs>